Hello my beautiful watchers, as you can see I've decided that this book needs an entire review all to itself before we can even begin to start discussing its adaptation. Before I get too stuck into it, first a spoiler warning, obviously I'm going to be talking about the whole book and some stuff from the sequels, more importantly though I feel I also have to include a trigger warning. And I don't mean what the internet at large has tried to turn those words into, i.e. someone might get offended by something I'm about to say. No, I mean I'm going to be discussing abusive relationships, both physical and emotional, consent, enthusiastic consent, withdrawal of consent, and, as those last three things imply, rape. If you are one of the hundreds of thousands of people around the world who have personally experienced some or all of these things, this video may bring up some painful memories for you, and I feel you deserve to be warned about that. While I am not one of these people, I'm going to be approaching these subjects as tactfully and respectfully as possible, and I have done my level best to make myself as informed as possible before discussing them. I humbly request that all of my beautiful watchers do the same. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the comments on this one, and if I see anyone posting anything hateful or unnecessarily argumentative, they will be permanently banned from the channel. And now now, believe it or not, I'm actually going to start by debunking some misconceptions about this book. Some of these were my own before reading it, and others I got from Twitter when I asked everyone who hadn't seen or read it yet to describe the plot to me. The most common mistake is thinking that Grey makes Anna sign a sex contract, basically making her his kinky slave. Said contract does exist in the book, and Grey certainly tries to make her sign it, but she never does. Whether this makes things better or worse is up for debate. On one hand, the contract is super illegal for reasons I'll come back to, but on the other hand, Grey still spends the entire book trying to dominate Anna and make her his powerless submissive, which means he's doing it without her written consent and over her repeated verbal objections, I might add. Another common falsehood is that at some point Anna uses a safe word and Grey ignores it, violating one of the most sacred laws of bondage. I can confirm that this 100% does not happen in the first novel, and my research into the sequel suggests that it never happens. Grey is, however, a tad inconsistent with how he treats the safe word, sometimes making sure that Anna remembers it before trying anything new but other times he makes her feel guilty for using it and punishes her for forgetting it, which robs it of its power for her. Other minor yet recurring mistakes in regards to this plot involve Anna being in the employ of Christian or paid for her kinky sex acts. In fact, she refuses multiple job offers from him and finds it deeply uncomfortable when he tries to buy her gifts, let alone ever accepts money from him. The last is that Grey indoctrinates her into enjoying his kinky pain punishments. This is slightly more open for debate as she does seem to enjoy some aspects of the playroom, however for the most part Anna never really gets into Grey's weird fetishes. I will definitely talk more about this in detail momentarily. Please don't believe for a second that I'm trying to defend this book, I just feel it's important that we hate it for the right reasons. The next misconception speaks more clearly towards the book's detriment, that Fifty Shades of Grey is a story about BDSM, which on the off chance you weren't aware stands for bondage, domination, sadism and masochism. If anyone who has not read the books tells you that, they are simply misinformed. If someone who has read the books tells you that, then they are guilty of an unfortunately high level of naivete towards what BDSM actually involves. Fifty Shades of Grey is about a man with deep psychological issues stemming from a traumatic childhood involving being neglected by a drug addicted mother and taken advantage of at age 15 by a much older woman, who deals with these issues by attempting to exert an unhealthy amount of control over anything and everything around him and occasionally punishing innocent women. That is not BDSM, that has nothing to do with BDSM. Quick admission, I have personally only dabbled in this particular fetish. I won't go into details, but suffice to say, these were not my only pair of handcuffs. While this means I'm not personally speaking from a point of expertise, I am closely acquainted with several people who are massively involved in BDSM, so a lot of what I'm about to tell you is their information, not mine. So, to start with, a real dominance, someone who fucking knows what BDSM is, would never try to dominate someone who's clearly not a submissive and does not want to be one. This is because bondage is not, at its fundamental level, about causing pain. It's about causing pleasure. The pain is just a means to that end, because the people involved are sadists or masochists people who find causing or receiving certain levels of pain pleasurable. Real BDSM is the pairing of two people who are perfect for each other. A dominant who gets off on control and punishing, and a submissive who gets off on helplessness and punishment. On top of that, they both know that by doing the thing they like, they're also pleasuring their partner, so it's super win-win all round. Therein lies the key and so very, very important difference between BDSM and what goes on in E.L. James's work. Anastasia is not into it. She's not 
not a masochist. She does not like or get turned on by being hurt or controlled or humiliated. What she does like is Christian Grey. She likes the non-sadistic side of his personality and she likes regular vanilla sex with him. But she clearly hates the bondage, hence why she didn't sign the contract. Put very simply and clearly, Anastasia unhappily agrees to the kinky sex so she can be with Christian, the young, rich, handsome man who took her virginity and who she's hopelessly infatuated with. I'm trying not to judge her too much on that one because, I mean, the only reason I have a tattoo on my leg is because the girl who took my virginity was really into them. For his part, he does everything in his power to beg, bully, and generally coerce her into signing it using everything at his disposal, from his very obvious self-awareness of his good looks and charm, to all the possible bribery he can think to put his money to. He basically does everything a real dominant wouldn't dream of. Someone who understands and respects the real BDSM lifestyle would be horrified at the idea of dragging someone into it if it became clear that it wasn't their fetish, because if that was the case, the things they wanted to do to them would be deeply traumatizing instead of fun. Again, putting it very simply, if a sadist is dominating and punishing a masochist, it's BDSM. If a sadist is dominating and punishing someone who doesn't like it, it is nothing but an abusive, controlling relationship, pure and simple. Another big clue that E.L. James, and by extension Grey, has no fucking clue what they're talking about, is Grey has no concept of aftercare, which is another huge part of real BDSM. After punishing a sub, a dominant will take great pains to comfort and care for him or her to make sure there are no negative effects after such an intense experience. This is sometimes just as important for the dominant too, as they've just done some pretty extreme stuff and they might feel like crap afterwards. Grey spanks the shit out of Anna, then immediately leaves. He's then completely shocked and flabbergasted to find out that hitting her made her cry. I would like to say that there is even the smallest chance that this was intentional, and E.L. James had cleverly written this, so it was Grey the character confusing his hang-ups with BDSM, not her. But, she wrote in that Grey attended classes on proper domination and submission, which is where he usually picked up his subs, so there is no excuse for him having such a warped idea of how this works. Okay, once again, warning, serious stuff incoming. One of the biggest controversies surrounding this book is the commonly held belief that Christian kind of crosses the line and full-on rapes Anastasia at some point in this book. <sighs> Let me put it this way, there were one or two occasions where he forcefully initiated various sex acts without consulting her, but there were no occasions that I could see where they have sex in this book when she doesn't want to. This is because she kind of always wants it, she's mad turned on by this guy. I mean, there's only a few occasions in the entire book where she says no to sex, and he's disappointed but he does accept it, they don't have sex. Don't get me wrong, I'm aware that that is on very, very, very shaky grounds. I mean, you could make the argument that Anna should get the final say in the matter, in which case it means he did not, but that kind of comes with its own set of problems because it's basically saying it's okay to take sex as long as you're 100% sure she wants it. Without checking. I'm not saying people don't appreciate forceful and spontaneous lovers, but that is something you have to establish ahead of time. Grey doesn't, he just assumes that Anna would like it if he fucked her without asking first, just like he assumes that she's enjoying being spanked without any evidence, resulting in him getting shocked when he makes her cry, then shocked again at the end when she tells him she hates it. Gods, that man is stupid. This is one of the ways in which having a contract would have actually made sense. If Grey had done what he originally said he was going to do, and not touched her until after she signed it, he would at least have had grounds for believing that Anna was the kind of person who liked this sort of thing, and justifiably have been horrified when he finds out that she's just been doing it under duress at the end, because she's worried that he'd immediately dump her if she didn't. But it's the opposite of that. All the evidence points to her not liking it, her until this point lifelong asexuality, her refusal to sign the contract, her tears afterwards. In reality, this is obviously just bad writing, but in universe, Grey got super lucky that Anna went from 0 to 100 libido-wise, or he would have been a rapist for sure. So for these reasons, I personally don't feel comfortable branding Christian Grey a rapist. However, it's still disgusting how up for debate that's made by this book, and I'm not sure that Christian Grey, were he a real person, would agree with me. My evidence for this is the contract, specifically the very fact that the contract is a contract. Again, I'm just talking in-universe logic here. In reality, E.L. James is just a fucking idiot. Grey tells Anna that he is aware that the contract is not legally enforceable, and you can bet your ass it isn't, and that it only exists so they can get an idea of what the other is into so he doesn't go too far. However, if that were the case, and it was just a simple communication aid, a list would have sufficed. He wouldn't have been so intense about her signing it as her signature wouldn't help with that at all. However, it would be very useful if Grey thinks he might end up having to defend himself against rape charges in a court of law someday. I'm just saying.
Although now that I think about it, Grey still has two books worth of chances to prove that he's a rapist, so I guess the jury's still out on that one. Grey is super contradictory in this, because he seems to show an awareness that his sexual tastes are very specific, but also seems completely unaware of it. He always seems 100% sure that Anna is going to enjoy being a submissive once she commits to it. There never seems to be any doubt in his mind about that, and, as I said, acts absolutely shocked whenever she suggests otherwise. This seems to imply that because he's never known anything else, having been made into a sub age 15 by a much older woman, that he doesn't understand that there can be life and love without a master-slave arrangement. But if that's the case, why would he go to such great pains to hide his lifestyle behind non-disclosure agreements and have a lawyer make up a friggin' contract that specifies what people will and won't do? That implies the opposite, that he knows full well that most people wouldn't share his tastes and he mustn't attempt it with the wrong person. The only excuse I can think of to explain this mutually exclusive behaviour, and it's a shaky excuse at best, is Grey is so befuddled by his love for Anna, he's desperate to force her into conceding to his sexual needs so he can have her and his damage, you know, cake and eat it sort of situation. From what I know about the sequels, Grey eventually realises that Mrs. Robinson did in fact mess him up, and he doesn't need his lover to be a sub to love them. I would just like to say for the record that portraying BDSM as something you have to be indoctrinated into while underage and naive and can escape from with the love of the right person is, once again, massively insulting, hugely unfair, and inaccurate to real BDSM, and E.L. James can go and stick both her hands in a blender. In regards to the contract itself, as I said, its existence does make a certain amount of sense. So much so that Grey's behaviour, despite its lack of being signed, throws either his morals or his sanity into doubt. However, even taking that into account, the actual wording of his contract is fucked up to the extreme. BDSM contracts are a real thing, but they're almost always written together by both participants. They're not something to be negotiated with concessions because, as I hope I have made clear, BDSM is something between two adults who both really want to be doing BDSM. This contract is nothing more or less than a list of demands from Grey. On top of that, it is not only not enforceable, as acknowledged in the book, it's also super illegal. It stipulates that once they've signed, the submissive cannot refuse any kind of sex at any time, and cannot leave the contract until the agreed time period is over, or the dominant violates the rules himself. That is such mega bullshit, because a person's right to withdraw consent is not something that can ever be signed away. It's protected by law. Or at least it's supposed to be. A contract that demands that you do so, even one that is not intended to be legally enforceable, is abhorrent because even discouraging someone from withdrawing sexual consent when they need to is morally bankrupt and potentially punishable by legal action. Another thing that pissed me the hell off in this is what the oh-so-romantic Mr. Grey says and what he does never matches up. He claims the contract is negotiable and he and Anna should talk about it thoroughly, but then he argues and gets annoyed with her over every little change she tries to make. He says there's no pressure to sign it because he wants her to want to do it first, but then he harasses her about it constantly, even when they're not together, then, when he thinks she's decided to say no, he refuses to take that for an answer, and immediately travels to her uninvited to change her mind using sex. He then claims he's going to compromise with her because she's making him feel things he's never felt before, and keep the dom and sub thing confined to the playroom, so they can have a normal relationship the rest of the time, but he never stops trying to control what she eats, when she sleeps, where she goes and who she sees, not for a second! Seriously, the constant level of control that Grey tries to exert over Anna is so horrible to read about. I swear, if he had passively aggressively forced her to eat when she wasn't hungry one more fucking time, I was going to borrow Terence's time and space turner and travel to his universe just so I could punch him in his fucking face. What's also really terrible is that even if you take out all the stuff that can be explained by Grey not understanding what BDSM is, there's still a fuck ton wrong with their relationship that has nothing to do with that. Grey freaks out about stuff for no reason. Anastasia is a 21-year-old student who just finished her exams and is about to graduate. Of course she's out getting wrecked with her friends that night, but he acts like she's done something terrible and makes her feel guilty as shit about it. And of course her being drunk is justification for him tracking her cell phone to find out where she is and fucking kidnapping her back to his hotel room. He already knew where she lived because at this point he'd already sent her $15,000 worth of gifts that she didn't want. He could have easily taken her back to her home. And the stalking, my god. 
gods, the stalking. Tracking her cell phone was just the start. He follows her to her place of work. He follows her halfway across fucking America. It's so bad, she seems genuinely surprised when he keeps his word and doesn't find out where she's applying for jobs like she asks him to. Oh, and let's not forget the rampant jealousy. Every time Anastasia even talks to another man, even before they're together, Grey gets this enraged look in his eyes and he actually snaps at her and storms out of the room because he thought, incorrectly, that she was texting a male friend. Most disturbingly of all, while she can't prove it, Anna realises that every time Grey has upgraded her plane seat, the one next to her has ended up being empty, even though the plane was full. Almost as if he booked the extra seat because he was so jealous he didn't like the idea of a man sitting near her. Christian and Anastasia have been dating for less than a month and they're already in an abusive relationship. There is no two ways about it. Just in case my personal lack of experience with this casts any doubt on my opinion, I downloaded some questionnaires about how to tell if you're in an abusive relationship from a woman's refuge website. He checks pretty much every box. I'll put the questions and answers on Twitter and Facebook to prove it. And the book romanticizes all of this. It tries to pass Grey's behaviour offers unashamed passion brought on by his infatuation with Anastasia. I do not and probably never will understand why Christian Grey would be appealing to women, and like I said at the beginning of the plot synopsis video, I also don't understand a great deal of the rest of the book's appeal either. However, and I am slightly embarrassed to admit this, there is at least one bit which I totally get. It's one of the places where the book's fan fiction beginning shows the most, because this also goes away towards explaining Twilight's popularity as well, namely, they present a scenario that's very appealing to people with low self-esteem. I realise this because, in a way, it's very similar to the scenario that made Spider-Man one of my favourite superheroes as a kid. I realise that statement's going to need a lot of explaining. Okay, here goes. Uh, unlike heroes like Superman or Thor, Peter Parker wasn't born naturally blessed with amazing abilities, and unlike Iron Man or Batman, he didn't earn his superhero status through genius or hard work either. Peter's powers were given to him due to a random event completely out of his control, and his following rise to physical superiority and badassery required no input from him whatsoever. Uh, there's going to be so many comments telling me I just don't understand Spider-Man. Anyway. Uh, this made Spider-Man very appealing to kids like me, who deep down believed that we could never really achieve anything great in life because we were too inherently lazy, or dumb, or naturally talentless. Uh, so the only way we would ever achieve anything really impressive is if something completely out of our control that required no work from us took place, like getting bitten by a radioactive spider. And Twilight and Fifty Shades work in a very similar way, but in regards to romance as opposed to superpowers. Bella and Anastasia are completely unremarkable in looks and abilities, and yet, due to circumstances out of their control, they are completely irresistible to shockingly attractive men who they would otherwise have considered to be way out of their league. In Twilight, it's based around the enticing smell of Bella's blood driving Edward wild. Yes, I know the story, but no, I'm not going to be covering it anytime soon. Um, in Fifty Shades, it's less defined early on, but there's just something about Anna that Grey can't resist no matter how hard he tries. It didn't matter that Anna made a complete tit out of herself when they first met, it didn't matter that she was so timid and nervous she could barely string sentences together in front of him, it didn't matter that she drunk dialed him and vomited on his shoes, Grey is infatuated with her regardless and willing to do all the work in bringing them together. Can you imagine how awesome that would be? How relaxing it would be? If a super a hot member of the opposite sex became so insanely interested in you that you didn't have to try at all with them. That you know, you just be your usual awkward, nervous self, and they gift wrap themselves and hand themselves to you on a silver platter. Wouldn't that be worth putting up with a few flaws in their character, you know? Maybe doing a few things in the bedroom you're not entirely comfortable with? Fuck no! I am over my teenage self-loathing phase, so my new favourite superhero is Doctor Strange, and I'd much rather be with someone who likes me for me, and not because of some hang-up of theirs. But, like I said, I can see where the appeal is coming from here. This concludes the slightly more structured element of the review. I shall now start shouting random complaints about this piece of shit masquerading as a book as they occur to me. Fucking Anastasia. I swear this character pissed me off almost as much as Grey. She never gets mad at him for his unacceptable behaviour. With the cell phone tracking thing, she actually thinks, well, that seems really wrong, but I guess it's okay because it's him. Apparently in her head, handsome rich guys can just do whatever they want. And she actually convinces herself she's pleased to see him in Georgia, despite her specifically asking him not to come. I was momentarily impressed, believe it or not, near the start of the book, because she acknowledges to herself that her friend Jose has the hots for her, but she just doesn't feel the same way about him. I thought it was refreshing that this book seemed to be steering away from all the tropes I hate so much. You know, it's like in The Hunger Games or The Princess Diaries, where the author seems to believe for some weird reason that the lead being continuously and frustratingly ignorant of people's affections for her would somehow be endearing. However, that awareness ends up making her seem like 
like a total bitch, because when Kate suggests that they get Jose to photograph Grey, she's like, Oh yeah, that's a great idea! Yeah, Anna, you go ahead and let your best friend strong arm a guy you know wants to be with you into taking glamour photos of a guy he knows is pursuing you. That's not an emasculating and insensitive thing to do at all! I would like to reiterate that all of these characters are scum! On this subject, but digressing slightly, if there's any ladies watching, please, for the love of all that is holy, never tell a guy that he is like a brother to you. We never want to hear that, even if we're not interested in you romantically. We know in theory that what you're trying to tell us is that you care about us deeply and value our friendship, but we can't help ourselves. What we hear is, Wow, even in principle you are so sexually unappealing to me, we might as well be related. It's not your fault that we're like this, but please bear it in mind. Getting back on subject, to make matters worse, it's not just Grey. Anna seems to have an unhealthy relationship with everyone. Kate bosses her around almost as much as Grey. Seriously, I got to wondering about halfway through the book if maybe she took such a dislike to him because he represented her having to share her personal slave with someone else. If Kate hadn't forced Anna to call Grey and set up the photo shoot for her, she might not have ended up in his web of abuse. Anna really didn't want to see him again at that point. With the exception of her stepfathers, all of the men in her life sexually harass her at some point or another. Jose you already know about but there's others like her work friend who asks her out every day despite her always saying no and the book presents this as acceptable and don't even get me started on her mother the woman who blows all of their money on ill-defined harebrained schemes i never did find out what that meant, and who prioritises her fourth husband's well-being over her daughter's. Okay, I guess we need to discuss the infamous tampon scene. Um, Grey wants to have sex while Anna is on her period, so without warning her he's going to do it, he pulls out her tampon and throws it in the toilet. Uh, then after they're done fucking, they have a bath together. As part of my research for this, I went to several fan sites for this book, and found out that some women actually find this endearing, uh, because they thought it was great to imagine a guy who is so comfortable with menstrual blood, he's not squeamish about touching it. Every other member of the female population of the world that I consulted seemed to find the idea that a guy would presume to interfere with their sanitary products uninvited deeply invasive. Were I of the female persuasion, I am certain I would side with the latter group. Grey is so much of a dick about money in this. It's made me rethink my life a little bit, specifically in regards to things like insisting I pay for meals on the first date. Grey's control issues somehow make generosity seem incredibly douchey. He insists on paying for everything, and this is on top of buying Anna a new car, upgrading her plane seat to first class without telling her, and buying her a whole wardrobe full of clothing that she didn't want. Grey's response to any objection is pretty much, get over it. I've got lots of money and I want to spend it on you, so why shouldn't I? <coughs> Cause it's making her feel cheap, you selfish asshole. Anna wants to pay for just one thing. One thing. Pancakes. They go to a cheap cafe and she asks if she can treat him. He accuses her of trying to completely emasculate him. On top of all this misrepresenting and borderline rape and terrible messages and horrible characters, the book is just so badly written. There's mistakes in this that they teach you how to avoid in primary school writing classes. Stuff repeats all the time. Anna thinks something, Grey asks her what she's thinking about, and she tells him in almost exactly the same way. At least with Daniel Handler, the repetition was an intentional part of his quirky writing style, and not just the author not understanding that the reader doesn't need to be given the same information twice in rapid succession. And on top of that, the fucking descriptives and I mean that both literally and figuratively, these sex scenes are so embarrassingly bad in this. It's like a 16-year-old virgin wrote them. Everything's just so hot. I mean, you know, no need to think of any other descriptive words. You know, oh, he does this and it's so hot, and then he does that and uh, it's so hot. She also kept saying something over and over again that I just didn't understand at all. His sweatpants were hanging off his legs that way. What does that mean? I mean, are we talking crotch bulge? If not, how does baggy trousers equal sexy? The only time I felt even the slightest pang of sympathy for Grey is when Anna screams out that she loves him at the end, because, I mean, if I'm reading the timeline correctly, they've only been dating for about three weeks tops at this point. I have to confess, if someone did that to me, I'd be like, oh, that's cool. Well, I, 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 I like, um, well, you, you know, I think I hear Reginald calling me. Yeah, coming, Reginald! So, one of the most notorious parts of this book that all the non-readers actually got right is all the stuff about the inner goddess. 
Basically, it's the name for the voice in Anna's head that's constantly encouraging her to go along with Grey's weird fetishes because she can't get enough of his huge dick. E.L. James didn't come up with the word, it's actually an established thing. Uh, from what I can see, an inner goddess is shorthand for getting in touch with one's feminine power or sometimes a sexual awakening. As the story goes on, Anna's inner goddess gets more and more personified in her head. I mean, she starts describing her doing complex dance moves or getting so surprised by plot twists she goes and hides behind the couch. Surprisingly, the inner goddess isn't what bothered me. I mean, sure, it's dumb and lazy writing, and the level of detail that starts going into the descriptions of her actions towards the end makes me worry about Anna's mental health, but it's largely harmless. No, what really bothered me is who came with the inner goddess. You see, while she's constantly whispering in Anna's ear that she should let Grey stick a butt plug up her ass, there's another personification constantly judging her and calling her a hoe that she names her subconscious. Don't get me wrong, I see what James is going for here. It's obviously the classic shoulder devil versus shoulder angel setup, but what drove me to the point of absolute rage was, that's not what subconscious means! If you're 100% clear on what your mind is trying to tell you, to the point where you can see a person crossing her arms and tapping her foot, it's clearly not subconscious. Subconscious is where you're not fully aware of something because it's below, or sub, your conscious awareness of it. This author doesn't know what words mean! What makes it even worse is, Anastasia is supposed to be an English major at college. I find it hard to believe she actually graduated if this is her understanding of the English language. I just want to reiterate one last time that while I'm not personally into it, I am all in favour of BDSM. There is nothing wrong with a person utterly controlling another person during a set period of time. There is nothing wrong with rope play, sex toys, spanking, flogging, humiliation, any of it, if and this is the biggest if in the universe, both parties enthusiastically want to do it. To borrow one of John Oliver's metaphors, bondage is like a boxing match. If both parties are up for it, it's a sport. If only one of them's up for it, it's assault. What really frustrates me about this book is how perfectly it would work as a cautionary tale. I've tracked down every interview with E.L. James that I could find online. I was convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that this could not possibly have been intended as a romance novel. This has had to have been intentionally written to be a story about the dangers of getting too fixated on a person's looks, charm and money, and not seeing that they are treating you like shit. She had to have been aware that this wasn't BDSM, but was really an emotionally damaged sadist taking out his traumatic childhood mother issues on his lover. Surely this synced up too perfectly with the documented behavioural patterns of manipulators and abusers to be by accident. Surely. So I watched E.L. James. I mean, I stared at her face so hard. I was trying to see some flicker in her eyes, some twitch when she was asked a question that would suggest she doesn't really believe that she wrote an edgy and sexy romance novel involving BDSM. But... It's basically a love story, and that's why, that's why I think that's what... with some kinky sex in it, which I think, you know... When Grey finds out that Anastasia is considering going to visit her mother without consulting him, he drags her outside, picking her up and throwing her over his shoulder when she can't keep up, and takes her off to a secluded spot to beat her. I don't care that he calls it spanking, she is fucking terrified. She has to beg him not to. Her exact words are, please don't hit me. This book is the furthest thing in the fucking universe from a love story! Oh god, that really hurt. My deepest fear is that some young, inexperienced person will read this garbage and because of it, think that this sort of behaviour is not only acceptable, but maybe even romantic. In that scenario, this book could end up hurting people. In conclusion, this is now the undisputed worst piece of shit I've ever had the misfortune to read. Its descriptions are garbage, the character names sound like they're out of an 80s porno, the message is dangerous, the plot is dull, and for anyone with any kind of real sex life, it's about as erotic as watching two rats shag in the sewer. Fuck you, E.L. James, you talentless, sexually repressed smug hack. Fuck. You. I hope I didn't make this too unpleasant for you, beautiful watchers. On a final note, I've included links to the various women's refuge websites that I visited while researching this. If you feel like making a donation, I'm sure it's a big help to them. To make myself feel less... filthy after reading this piece of shit, I'll be donating the ad revenue I make from all three of my Fifty Shades themed episodes at the end of the month. Right, just the adaptation left to go. One last look at this shite and I am done forever because I will not be covering the sequels. I'm sorry, beautiful watchers, I just can't put myself through this again. See you soon.
Hey, beautiful watchers, I just wanted to give you a quick reminder that there's a variety of rewards you can earn by becoming a Patreon, including early access to all videos, getting to be a part of the survey about how many people saw the film and read the book, or playing Minecraft with me on my 24-hour server. Higher level contributors can also join the Dom Skype chat room, and best of all, choose future episodes of Lost in Adaptation. However, if right now you are thinking, My goodness, the Dom, I can't do that. I just don't want to. Fear not, if you would instead be willing to like, share, subscribe, or a combination of all three, that goes a long way towards helping my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. Have a most pleasant day, and I will see you soon.